I am here with Eduardo Molinari, uh, who just qualified for the U.S. Open at Pinehurst. Let's start there. First of all, congratulations. And did you think going into that qualifier you're gonna you're gonna qualify? Um, you never know really playing a qualifier. It's uh, 36 holes in a day. Uh, you need to be on that that, that single day. Um, I never qualified that way before for U.S. Open. I played a few, but always through like order of merit or top 50 in the world. Um, so it was a you know a new way to get in, and obviously very very happy to to be able to play at Pinehurst next week. Was it kind of extra special doing it alongside your brother? Yeah, I think uh, it was the same day. Uh, obviously, I was playing in the UK, so I qualified before, and then I text him when I finish. Well, I think he texts me, and I think he just finished his first round uh, over in Dallas. And uh, we're obviously he had a very good first round. And so, yeah, when, when he made it, I think it's uh, it's always extra special. You know, anytime you can play a major championship alongside your brother, uh, the week is always a bit more fun. It's a bit more relaxed. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be nice. Have you played at Pinehurst before? No, never, never. Uh, I didn't qualify in 14 and I was too young when I played in 2005, I think it was. Yeah. So, oh, no, never played. I watched some footage and then, uh, no. I'll just uh, go there and usual practice rounds and stuff. Cool. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so going to the Ryder Cup real quick, you you were a vice captain last year. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're also the, the chief data strategist for Arcos. And how did those things mesh together? So how much data and analytics went into, one, selecting that team, and two, making the pairings each each day? Uh, I think we leaned on the data pretty heavily. I mean, I think Luke was great because obviously I was looking at all the numbers, all the data. Um, you know, he was. I was chatting to some of the players. He was chatting to other players, uh, and we were able to kind of mesh the two things together. Like obviously the data says something, but then if player A and B they don't want to play with each other, then it doesn't really matter what the data says. Um, so it was, a, I think it was a good combination and it was, a, it was very tricky, especially I think for foursomes, because you need also to look at like balls and then you know, who plays odds, who plays games. Uh, but in the end, we, I thought we had a, a very good plan going in. Um, that's the reason why we started with foursomes as well, because we thought we were better in foursomes than, than four balls than, than the US. And I think the result proved that we were uh, spot on. Absolutely. How, how often do you see like, um, people on the team say they don't want to play with with certain other players or they prefer to play with somebody else? Uh, it happens. I mean, um, we, we we started chatting to the players well in advance of the Ryder Cup. Um, and then I think it was about when the team was finalized, obviously you, you only have 12 players. And then you start asking, you know, each one of them, what would your preference be? Uh, without really, you know, giving away too much, but you want to listen from them what, you know, what their preference is. And then if their preference matches the data, then then great. And then if not, you find some sort of compromise uh, along the lines. So one of the players on the team who, when you, you guys made the selection, there's a little bit of controversy around it with Ludwig Oberg. Um, mm. I thought it, I thought he had to be on the team. And, and the fact that there was controversy around it, I think shows kind of, how silly some opinions are out there because what he's proven then and since makes it yeah. obviously seem like the right decision. What, yeah. so what were your feelings on him and being around him and watching him play? Like what, what level of talent does he have? Well, Ludwig is, uh, you know, as Luke uh, put it very, very nicely, I think he's a generational talent. Someone like him is, you know, comes out once every 10 or 15 years at least. Um, I was following Ludwig already when he was in college the last last season he had in college because uh, I, I was appointed vice captain back in May 22 and you know one of the first few chats I had with uh, Henrik Stenson who was captain at the time he said is there anyone that you know coming up young that might be making the Ryder Cup team and he thought I was going to name someone playing in Europe or some you know young pro and I said, well, there's a Swedish kid that plays in Texas and he's, you know, he's got every chance if he turns pro. And then it turned out that he wasn't turning pro that summer. He was waiting another year. And then I play, I requested to play with Ludwig when he came over to Dubai in February, well, January 23. So that was like nine, nine months before. And he was still an amateur and I was blown away by what I saw. Because like off the tee, 
you know, I've seen and I've played pretty much with everyone in the last 15, 20 years. And I, I said to Luke straight away, I think he's even better than Rory of the team. Like what I've seen in these two days is like crazy good. And then he just kept playing as an amateur, obviously played really well, turned pro. And then at that time we started pairing him with, you know, potential Ryder Cup players. He played with Luke a couple of times. He played with uh, other vice captains. And then every time someone played with him, it was like, well, you know, this kid needs to be on the team. Uh, and then obviously he had this stretch of good results. And then I think Luke asked him to play the last two events in Europe uh, before qualifying ended. Uh, because he wasn't exempt on the, on the PGA Tour, there were the playoffs, and he came over and he finished fourth and won. So that <laughs> he made our job very, very easy. But it was, I mean, it was very obvious what you could see. I mean, someone that turns pro and starts racking up like top 20s in elevated events or, you know, big PGA Tour events, it's, it's something very special. And he wasn't phased, he wasn't, he was just, you know, playing his own game. And so we were, you know, we were lucky that Ludwig turned pro at the right time. How many majors do we think for, for Ludwig? How many major wins in his career? Yeah. Uh, difficult question. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that can can happen. I mean, look at Rory, that he hasn't won a major in 10 years. So it's, uh, I would go, I would go probably around five. And yeah, I think that sounds good. Uh, so, speaking of Rory, yeah, speaking of Rory, why do you think he hasn't won a major in 10 years? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I think, um, you know, sometimes sometimes you need to be lucky, first of all. It's only four events a year. If you don't play one of those four weeks, you just have to wait another year, and that can happen. Um, secondly, I think Rory likes to play, like, very aggressively off the tee into the greens, and sometimes you cannot quite do it at majors. Like, if you look at Rory's major wins, they all... Well, some of them came on like very soft courses, like Congression, like super long, soft, and he was able to separate himself by by many shots there. Um, so I think it's a uh, you know it's a combi. Sometimes he got unlucky when like you know Wyndham Clark last year he played unbelievable golf. Otherwise, Rory would have won a major. Um, it's it's a combination of things, and it's it, that's why I think it's it's very difficult to say or oh, player someone is going to win 10 majors because it's, you could play i mean rory literally hasn't been outside top probably top five in the world for most of his career and he's you know he's been 10 years without winning a major so but you never know i mean my maybe you know he wins one and then he wins the next two or three in a row uh, he's that good so i think it's just a bit of a randomness there so for 2025 the Ryder cup is the whole uh, whole band coming back together for the whole staff no, I, I, well, at the moment it's Luke, myself, and Thomas Bjorn, which obviously were part of it in in Italy in '23. I think there will be a couple of changes made to the to the backroom staff. Obviously, the you know the players always change quite a bit from from one Ryder Cup to the other. I think usually six or seven are the same, and then almost half of the team just gets changed every every two years. Uh, but even in the backroom team, I think you you know you want to obviously keep having people that. You know, are still playing or a couple of experienced guys and then it just depends who qualify who doesn't qualify i mean you look there's, there's a few players that might not qualify and then they could be possible future captains so you might bring them in i mean i think you, you need to be flexible and i think why that's why luke named thomas and myself early on because he, he wanted to have someone that he's familiar with that he liked from from his previous captaincy and then we just see, well, he'll decide when, you know, when things are a bit closer. Have you already begun, like, analyzing data? Because obviously uh, Beth Page is going to be a very different situation than it was in Rome. Have you already kind of looked at that and, and, and tried to analyze what, you know, how different it might be and what players might suit that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's a, it's a job that never stops because when, when Luke called me, Luke was named in December and and then he called me a couple of days before and said well i'll be doing it again but i need you as well so from that time from that point onwards you start looking at things and preparing stuff and um you know forming ideas uh we went to play beth page with luke uh, three weeks ago more or less uh for a couple of days we were there and we played the course we had a look around uh, and yeah, you, you start, you know, you start, you know, gathering ideas and, and looking at the data of previous 
you know, they had playoff events, they had majors, they had PGA Tour events, they had pretty much everything there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the data, there's a lot of data there. Then obviously the home team can can change some some things. But I think Bethpage is a is a solid golf course. It's long. It's usually plays pretty tough. Um, so I think it would be a fantastic venue for the Ryder Cup. So this year is going to be a little bit different for for a couple of reasons. One, winning a road Ryder Cup isn't the same as winning a home Ryder Cup. Mm-hmm. But I would I would say that it seems like now the European team, you know, while in the past you look at you know when your brother and Fleetwood were so great in France. It, this the team now is a little bit different, where they have those big bombers, the Rorys, the Ludwigs. Uh, do you think the team is now more positioned to win a Road Rider Cup based on the skill set on the team? Yeah, I think. Um, well, to start with, I think winning an away Rider Cup is probably one of the most difficult things in golf right now. Uh, because obviously the course set up, the crowds. I think I think people underestimate how much the the crowds can can have an impact, especially if they start getting under your skin. Then then it it becomes a very long week. Like we saw that in Rome, you know, all of a sudden for certain players, you know, there wasn't any. I thought they, there was a lot of sportsmanship even in the crowds, but even then, if they're shouting and singing the whole time, it just makes up for a very, very long day if you don't actually try to enjoy it, even if you're playing away. Uh, so I think that would be key. And then, as you were saying, I think that the skill set of the two teams now, it's very, very similar. Um, if anything, it flipped. Like in Rome, we were longer off the tee. Uh, they were a little bit short. US were a little bit shorter, a little bit straighter off the tee. But I mean, those. I think these days, most most good players play on the PGA Tour, so they have to have a very similar skill set. Like if you look at 20 years ago, most Europeans were much better at hitting fairways and greens. They were hitting it shorter. Like we we had a lot more of the Faldos, the Vuzi, the Montes, uh, while you know the US had like Kapos and Davis Love and all those guys that were like bombing it. I think now it's very very similar, and I think why that's why course setup can have a little bit of an impact, but it, you're never going to see another Ryder Cup where it's like, or what, like Hazeltine, where it was like wide open, semi-rough and, and just bomb it away. Uh, or if Paris, like Paris was the opposite, was like narrow, thick, rough. I think it's going to be much more, um, uh, yeah, much more subtle, the, the changes that you have to make to the, to the course. So you, you guys in the US team are in much different places now because of the way the players can kind of qualify. We, we saw in Rome, they brought Brooks Kepka, uh, mm-hmm. who's a live player. Now, the difference now is your play, your, some of your best players now aren't European Tour members, um, or I, I don't even know if they are or they're not, with, with Rahm and Hatton. And these are the, you know, two of maybe the top six players on, on your team. Uh, mm-hmm. ha- Rory kind of came out right after Rahm left and said, that he thinks um, Ram will still be on the team. Where are you guys at with all that? Well, basically nothing has changed from two years ago, which means that obviously John at the moment is still a European Tour member. Tyrrell is a European Tour member. And as long as they play their minimum, uh, which is four events a year, four full DP World Tour events a year, then they're eligible for the Ryder Cup. And it was the same two years ago, you know, when, when some of the guys that went to leave they decided either to resign the membership or they didn't play the minimum, so they were not eligible. But there were some guys that went and you know paid all the sanctions, and then they were still eligible. So it's not really down to us. It's more like you know if they want to play, they know that they just need to play four events and and not resign the membership. And you know hopefully they will do because everyone knows how good John and Tyrrell and you know even some of the others that went are. And you want to be able to pick from from anyone. So, as I said, you know, hopefully, I think there's been a lot of discussions going on behind the scenes and conversations, uh, and hopefully, you know, that they will remain members. I think John is obviously very, very keen with the with the Sevi and Olazabal legacy to to keep playing Ryder Cups. Tyrrell is the same. I mean, the thing is, I think the Europeans they really love and enjoy Ryder Cup. They they look forward to it every every two years. It's like if you ask any one of them now, they're already thinking into Bethpage, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I'm, I'm very confident that John and Tyrrell especially will do everything they can to to remain members. And then you know there's other European guys as well on leave that you know 
if they keep playing well, you might you might want to pick or they might qualify through the majors. I don't know what's going to happen from here to September 25. But again, as long as as long as the European Tour members then they're eligible to to play to be picked. So hopefully that that's what's going to happen in the next uh, 14 months. So for them, they would have to obviously not resign the membership, continue to pay fines and play in four events. That would probably be com- coming in the fall. Once they're yeah, but, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I mean, they could have played, you know, Abu Dhabi, Dubai in the beginning of the year, which they didn't do. But I mean, they, they you know, they can do whatever they want as long the, the only the only thing that they need to accomplish is to remain DP World Tour members, and as long as they're members, then all of a sudden you can you can pick them, you can they can qualify. Uh, so that's pretty much that's it's on their hands. Like there's nothing Luke, myself, uh, even Rory included can do. Uh, right. It's not you can change the route from one year to the other because obviously you know the guys that were there before they resigned the membership not to pay the sanctions and then they're not eligible. So I, I'm very confident that then John and Tyrrell and, and some others will, you know, there's a couple others as well that are still members. Um, and I'm and I'm very confident and hopeful that they will remain members and uh, and be able to play right ahead. So what's your relationship been like with uh, that other class of players who were a big part of the last 20 years of Ryder Cups, the Sergios, the Westwoods, at one point, I'm sure the relationship was strong, and you know Sergio was pretty outspoken about wanting to play in the Ryder Cup, but obviously he didn't do what he had to do to remain eligible. Has your relationship with those players completely changed since all this stuff has happened? No, I wouldn't say so. Uh, like I've known Sergio for, you know, I played the first time with Sergio when I think I was 15 and he was 16, so I've known him for like 20, 20, I don't know, 28 years, nearly 30 years now. Uh, I've never been great friends with him, as he, I've never been very close to him. But you know, I've always had a chat with him when I saw him, and and we've known each other a long, long time. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't have anything, anything against Sergio, against uh, you know, even Westy. When I played my first Ryder Cup, I was in the team with him, and he was extremely helpful. He he was trying to help me as as much as he could. Uh, just made me feel part of a family, and I will be forever grateful for that. Uh, so it's not like because they went to leave, all of a sudden everything changes. It's just that you know, if they decide not to be members, and you know, that means they can't play Ryder Cup, then it's, again, it's, it's their decision. Mm-hmm. But I don't have anything to you know begrudge or or behold against them. I, mean, I think even even Polter, like you know, again, I've, I've never been very close to to Ian, but we play Ryder Cup together, and and I th- I feel like every time you play the Ryder Cup with someone, then you become especially in Europe, you can become like better friends, you become much closer. Uh, and I've always enjoyed, you know, being alongside Ian and, and the, the energy and everything that he brought to the team room. Um, so I've got, you know, nothing nothing to say apart from, from great things of, of all of them. And again, it's not, you know, unfortunately things change in life and they decide to, you know, to go play live and, and then, you know, they made some decision that prevented them from, from playing Ryder Cup. But I don't have absolutely anything against them. So you guys, as the European side, have been more successful on the road than the U.S. team. Mm-hmm. Uh, why do you think that you guys have an easier time coming together and, and winning a Road Rider Cup and, and than they have? Uh, good question. I think it's, a, again, it's a combination of different reasons. I think, one, we are more used to travel a lot like as a European tour player, you go to South Africa, you go to Australia, you go to China, like half of our season is away from Europe. And even when it's in Europe, it's like a different country. So you're not playing in your home country the whole time. So when it comes to going to the US, it's like, it's just, you know, it's actually better than a lot of other countries that, that you go to. Um, and it's, you know, so that that's not, that's not like a, a hurdle in itself that we need to overcome. And then I think the other part is like obviously the you know it's been talked about a lot, but like the the team chemistry, how much everyone really likes each other and try to help each other, and uh, I mean it's amazing. Like some of the stories from you know from the Ryder, any Ryder Cup week, you always hear of you know guys like Rory going to Nikolai or to Bob. I mean literally Rory was treat. I saw Rory treating Nikolai and Bob. He must have spent maybe you know 
four or five, he must have seen them four or five times in his life before Ryder Cup week. And all of a sudden in the practice trip that we went to two weeks before, he was like, Nikolai was his younger brother and, and Bob was his best friend. And it's like, it really makes you think about how much Rory and John and, and those guys, they really care about Ryder Cup. They really try to, you know, try to help the younger guys. And all of a sudden that elevates the whole team. And I think especially when you go away, it, that's that's massive. That's that's very, very important because all of a sudden you might be a rookie playing in front of an away crowd, your first Ryder Cup. It's a very uncomfortable situation. But if you have someone like Rory or John saying, well, you know, I've been here before, this is going to be fine, you're good enough, whatever. And and they actually behave, not only they say it, but like during the week and during the weeks before, they just, you know, behave in a way to make you feel part of a family. All of a sudden, I think it's uh, it really uplift all the all the younger kids. And, and um, again, if you play, you know, as a team, if you play everyone together, um, you can you can achieve some amazing things. Yeah, I think that's spot on, especially looking at, um, you know, in my opinion, the last Ryder Cup, it didn't seem like the U.S. team was as together as, as your team was at all. Uh, and then look, going forward, I still think there are some questions. You know, this seems like it's been the longest it's ever taken. Uh, taken for the U.S. to name a captain. Um, mm. And what do you think is going on there? Do you think they're waiting for Tiger? What What's going on? Uh, no idea, to be honest. We hear nothing from from their camp. There's no. It's not like you know. There's not any kind of communication or anything apart from you know the odd conversation that Luke might have to, with the, with the PGA or PGA of America. Um, to be honest, I have no idea. It's, you know, in the past, sometimes we were quite late announcing a captain. This time it seems like they're taking their time, but I, I don't think there's any rush, you know, it's still still a long way away. Obviously, you know, maybe we, we started working on this a little bit earlier because this is, I think for us, this would be like a, a massive turning point. If you if you manage to win an away Ryder Cup at Bethpage in front of the New York crowds, it could be something historical because uh, everyone is expecting us to lose even if we if we won the last one. Uh, so that's why I think we, we started very early and we're really looking at, you know, every possible little things that could help. Um, but, you know, going back to US is like, I don't think there's a, there's a blueprint for success like sometimes a late captain, you know, a captain announced very late can be can be fantastic. Sometimes someone announced very early can be a disaster. The other way around, uh, there's there's a lot of things that go into a Ryder Cup, a lot of little little details, um, and then at the end of it, it's it's the players. You know, if you know, you might prepare everything 100%, but then if two of your best players don't play well, all of a sudden it's it's difficult. Do you think Phil Mickelson will ever be a Ryder Cup captain? Difficult question. <laughs> I think with everything that went on in the last few years, it doesn't look like at the moment. But again, you never know. You know, we've uh, there's been so many U-turns and 180 degrees uh, uh, change of minds and ideas in the last 18, 24 months. I I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't bet against it. But I wouldn't bet for it. It's like completely. I think it's impossible to 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 answer. I think it would be great to have Phil as a captain, but I'm not sure that it's going to happen now. So earlier this year, you said you thought live players were kind of throwing away their careers. Do you do you still feel like that's the case, or do you think the landscape has shifted to where it's not quite as bad as it initially felt and looked at the beginning? Um, I think it's still a risky move. Uh, it depends where where in your career you are. Like obviously, I'm I'm 40 something, and you know it's different if someone that is like 40, 45 towards the end of the career, you get thrown uh, a silly amount of money to go play, then the decision might be different than someone who's 20, 22, 25, and you know up and coming, playing majors. Um, I, I think you know. It's a very difficult situation. It's, uh, as I said, I think it's a very risky move, especially if you're a young guy, because you might end up missing, you know, the best part of your career. You might not be able to play majors. And like, if you look at Neiman, for example, he's he's young. He's one of the best players in the world, and now he's not playing U.S. Open next week. Uh, 
obviously that's you know there's a, a, a thousand reasons why that's not happening and you could say it's his fault it's someone else's fault it's the usga it's leave it's whoever but at the end of the day as a player you're not playing which i think in his situation when you're like you know mid-20s and, and one of the best players in the world it's it's a bit sad but again it's uh, you know some players decided to go some players decided that you know obviously the, the reason they went you know you, everyone knows it's mostly money so it's it's basically how much you value money versus you know winning majors or trying to make history in the game of golf and uh, and then hopefully in the next few years it'll be everything will be kind of back together but i think it's still uh, it's still a long way to go before everyone can can play on on a single tour and you know play together a bit more often than just uh, four majors at best because again we started missing some players in the majors now right did did, did live ever approach um you and maybe an all italian team you and your brother guido matteo no 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 i don't think we're uh, nowhere near good enough to to be there so no 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 one approached us and no they're, they're, i mean to be honest I'm, I'm happy doing what i do and it's like you know I, I i enjoy so much this uh you know being involved in the rider cups and being around the guys and then have this uh you know stats thing on the side as well which i'm very happy where i am and you know i wouldn't I mean, again you know you never know in life but i wouldn't i wouldn't go for now so so as far as your career going forward you you're into the analytics the rider cup um but in terms of your playing you've you've played on six continents you've won on four of them europe south america africa and asia um and you know you're still young enough to play some great golf we've seen a lot of players you know in their early 40s win some big events what what are your personal goals in terms of on the golf course going forward? Um, well, I, I would like to to win at least one more time on DP World Tour. I feel like I'm uh, I'm hitting the ball good enough. I struggled with the putters in the last couple of years. Uh, I feel like this year I'm putting way better. I had a bit of a slow start, uh, but I'm starting to play some really good golf. Uh, the thing is, I it's true that I I spent some time doing this you know stats and analytics like consultancy for some of the some of the players I, I work with but on the other hand it gives me the chance to improve as a player to discuss things with them that otherwise i would have never had a chance like you know say next week i'm going to Pinehurst, and you know victor texts me already a couple of times hey can we can we play a practice round together and it's like you know imagine you know if i wasn't doing this there's not a chance in the world that a top five player in the world is going to text me saying oh, can we play a practice round together yeah uh, which obviously it means that what i'm doing works well for victor and and he likes to to hear what i have to say but on the other hand i i get to learn so much from him that it's it's amazing for me as a player as well so it, it worked you know in, in two ways and and so far i've been able to to do both uh, to a decent level uh obviously you know i have family as well and, and as, you, as you said before I'm, I'm 43 so i i might have another i don't know four or five years left of decent golf um so it's also you know looking at the future and start planning things i like to keep myself busy and you know i don't like to just sit at home on the sofa watching tv so it's you know it, it's a good uh, it's a good way to spend the the second the, you know the last half of my career the second half of my career and um and as you say you know I'm, I'm still playing i would like to you know i would like still to win i feel like i, I can i can still win some events um and you know you never know you, you've played pretty well in U.S. Opens. Uh, you made the cut in the last three. The most recent one, 2021, you finished in a tie for 35th. Really, really good. Do you think, you know, what would you consider a good week at Pinehurst for you? A uh, good week would be something better than 30 Pines, I would say. I would be very happy with that. So say yeah. 30 to 25 would be, would be, I would be extremely pleased. Um, again, it's, you know, the, the, I feel like the, the level of the, the, the top level in the game has gone, has improved so much in the last few years. Everyone is hitting the ball longer. Everyone is putting better. Everyone is, you know, everyone is a better player. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very curious to test myself against, uh, against those guys on a, on a very tough golf course. I always enjoyed tough golf courses. That's why I think I've, I've always done decent in US Opens because it's, uh, you have to think your way a little bit more. It's not like uh, you just go for the pin and you know try to make as many birdies as possible. I feel like when the tougher it gets, the the more it suits me. 
uh, and I really enjoy I enjoy the test, uh, which I think is the key there. Because if you start uh, morning on Monday, the the greens are too firm and the rough is too thick, then then you're out for a, for a long week. Uh, while I really enjoy you know grinding out pars and, and trying to you know to shoot a score even in the in difficult conditions, and uh, I'm really looking forward to next week. So most U.S. Open venues, it's like you need to hit it long and straight. The, the rough is really penal. This one feels a little different to where there's going to be a lot of run out, not much rough. Uh, do you think that brings, you know, so typically you look at a U.S. Open, and I feel like there's 10 or 12 guys who can really win it. Like, does, does this feel like it opens it up for more of the field because of the conditions that the course might be in? Mm, I'm not so sure, because uh, I think Pinehurst is also a very fair test of golf, even if there's no rough. Sometimes no rough brings the best players out, mm-hmm. uh, like the best players up the leaderboard, because it's, you know, even if you miss a shot, if there's if there's no rough, all, you always have a chance to, to get it up and down, especially if you miss it on the right side of the of the pin or the green. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that, you know, say that the top, the top five, six players in the world, there will be at least two or three up the leaderboard on, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, that's usually what you want from a, from a good venue. Uh, and from what I've heard, I mean, yes, there's no rough, but you still have to hit a lot of fairways, a lot of greens. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, especially hitting a lot of greens will be difficult because, uh, obviously elevated greens, runoff areas, all of a sudden the green becomes half the size of what, what it looks like. Um, so again, I'm, I'm really, I'm really curious. I'm looking forward to it. I've, I've spoken to a lot of players and a lot of them said that, you know, when they played in 14, you, they felt it was one of the best US Opens in the last 15, 20 years. Um, so I'm, I'm excited and yeah, I think it'd be a great test. All right. Well, I'm, I'm very thankful for the time you gave me today. No uh, and I want to say good luck in the US Open. Uh, good you. luck, and, and I hope you win on the DP World Tour coming up soon, and I, I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. See you soon. Thank you.